these headphones aren't necessarily a fashion statement in the making, so. Yeah, they're fashionable. I mean, yeah, if what you've do got you want? short hair and you're wearing a hat. Let's see if I can get me a pink set or something like that. You should. We should look at some, or at least you kept spray leaning them. that way. So I want to tilt your mic just a little, because right. people want to hear what you have to say, babe. Okay. Hi guys, welcome back to part two of this week's Yala. We are going to get started right away because there were so many great questions this week. We got to a lot in part one, so make sure you check that out. Uh, and we don't want to waste any time not answering your questions. This is your first time to the channel. Welcome. Thank you for tuning in and definitely hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out a lot. And thank you for asking all these great questions. First one. Oh, let's go. First one. Marie anybody, I, I got to throw this in there. I mean, we get a, a bonus prize for anybody that truly knows where that reference comes from. I use it fairly regularly because I think it's hilarious. <laughs> it is hilarious. Oh, let's go. If anybody can put in the comments below where that comes from, uh, we got to do something. We'll give a hat away or something. Yeah, why not? First person that throws it in the comments, we will send one of the new hats. And speaking of new hats. Ooh, spoiler have, alert. Yeah, all y'all that watch this stuff, you get all of the insider dibs. Um, we've got uh, three new hat designs coming out. Four. Four. Four new hat designs, including a specific women's hat. Ladies hat. hat. Woo woo. So For, that I can look stylish wearing these clunky headphones. And have a high ponytail for on those days you feel just a little more sassy. That's that was right. how they explained it to me that they needed the ponytail hats. I'm like, okay. It was a good selling point. Yeah. I convinced them. Yeah. So new hats coming out. We will give you a hat of your choice for the first person that comments where Let's Go references from. Okay. Now so, questions. Now questions we're getting to questions. questions. From Marie Bascom on Facebook, tips for young pups and traveling in cars. How often do you stop and how do you let them go potty safely before fully vaccinated? Ah, it's a good one. And it's a very important one to think about because it's a huge problem. And uh, we have seen, and uh, probably a couple of the listeners uh, that tune in here every once in a while have seen this firsthand, unfortunately. And um, actually picked up Parvo while traveling on the road with their dog to their house. So yes. it's um, it's definitely a problem. Things are everywhere. The key to that is going someplace where where Less, no man has gone before, where you don't see a lot of dog sign. So don't pull over on the side of the road and go, oh, there's a lot of dog poop around here. And there's Not a good some, place to yeah, go. there's some limitations with that. Where if it specifically says no dogs, obviously you can't do that. But um, typically for us, I'm stopping on the side of the road. Um, or, you know, because we typically are traveling in a more rural environment most of the time. So you can pull down a quarter mile down a gravel road and you know, park on the approach or whatever and let dogs out to pee in the ditch, basically. But it's a low traveled um, area that's a lot safer uh, for everything involved. So and we usually are using some kind of a an extension lead or whatever to still have a hold of our puppy, especially if we're anywhere that sure, there's a yeah. little more going on. On leash. Um, so that they're on leash for their safety. But also, if you can make sure your puppy has an opportunity to pee and poop prior to loading them up in the car and getting on the road, I would say on average, if they haven't recently tanked up on water or ate a huge meal and we get a pee and poop prior to loading them up and they fall asleep, I can make it a good four hours. Yeah. I was going to say three to five, depending on the age of the puppy and, and dog and yeah. everything else. So. so it's not like you have to stop every 30 minutes to give them a potty break. So usually it ends up being potty and about as often as you stop for fuel. So yeah. depends how big your gas tank is. Next question from Janine Smith on Facebook. Oh, she's Ooh. getting she's getting ballsy here. Uh oh. If I can, I'd like to ask two questions. Two questions. One question for you. And then I'll answer one. So Ethan will get one, I'll get one. <laughs> we, we'll make it work. I got you, girl. What is your thoughts on where she should sleep overnight? We have a one-year-old GSP, roughly 65 pounds. I feel bad putting her in the kennel overnight because Monday through Friday, she's in there a good portion of the day while we're at work. I'm trying to train her to sleep on her dog bed in our bedroom at night, but she tries to sneak up on our bed any chance she gets. So it often is a battle of wills on where she ends up. So my questions are, 
Where do you recommend a dog sleep at night? Got and it. what size kennel would be appropriate for a dog her size? You said 65 pounds? Yep. Okay. Hmm, which question do you want? I'll answer the first part. Got so it. typically we don't start letting our dogs sleep out overnight until they're around a year. So check. That's where you're at. Yeah. Um, all of our dogs are also collar conditioned to stay on a dog bed. We've really worked on place training prior to this process happening. So the expectation is that they go lay on and stay on their dog bed. You were mentioning a battle of wills and believe me, that can still happen. Questy pup who's snuggled up over there. You probably can't see her is really bad about trying to get in bed with us. Yeah. And Nix, her grandpa is actually a super sneaker. He will sneak over to my side of the bed and jump up in the middle of the night. And I don't even wake up sometimes. And I'm a, and I'm a super light sleeper. There you go. Sorry, I got too far away. You're fine. Just um, helping. So it can definitely be a battle of wills. The thing is to be consistent. So if you tell the dog, no, you need to be on the dog bed, that's where they need to stay. And if mm -hmm. they sneak up into bed, you need to, you know, go back on your dog bed, get up out of bed, take them over to their bed and say, this is where you need to be. This is where you need to stay. If you give in and you're like, oh, I'm just tired. It's fine. It's fine tonight. Well, that's going to become the habit. That's going to be the routine. And your dog is going to think, well, if I just try one more time, mom will eventually give up and I'm going to get to sleep in bed. So be the more powerful will of that equation and say, sure. if you are in the bedroom, you are on the dog bed. If you are okay with the dog sleeping in bed, which for sure there's times where I'm like, hey, I want to sleep with one of the dogs tonight or Ethan's gone. So I'm like, hey, I want to sleep with all four of the dogs that are in the bedroom tonight. Um, I just make that decision and I make it clear and I invite them into bed. Now, if they invite themselves into bed, I'm like, no, get on your bed. Even if it was my plan for them to sleep in bed with me overnight, I make sure that they're on their dog it's a bed. It's very subtle. It's a subtle dominance yep. behavior that we're trying to exhibit with the dogs and saying, you're only allowed when I invite you. So you get on the bed, stay there for another few minutes, then I'm going to invite you into the bed. So have a strong will. Well played. Well played. As far as... Um, Kind of segueing into the crate aspect of things. This also is just a little more. We do this a lot. The additional step to this that Kat didn't mention is even our dogs that get the opportunity to sleep in bed sometimes or on their dog beds or sometimes, um, they all are expected to also understand that sleeping in a crate is part of life. So we do some nights in the crate, some nights on the dog bed, some nights in the bed. All of those things are fine and all of those things learn. Now, granted, uh, some of them is there's some pushback sometimes where it's like, hey, I've been out the last like quest the other night. Yeah, quest the other night. So usually our dogs are really quiet and really Super well behaved. Quiet. And we wake up to whining, yipping, barking mid, you know, it's like an hour after we've laid down to go to bed or so. And um, she's barking. She says, I want up because she'd been up the last three, four nights. She's super easy. She's very well behaved. And she you almost was, forget that she's there. But she falls into that age category where she's on the younger end of the spectrum of some of the dogs that we have. And she's it's actually saying her birthday in like a week. Oh, yeah. She she and I are birthday twins. We'll um, recreate the Instagram picture from my last birthday. You mean she's, her first birthday or yeah. something? One of those. I don't know. I don't know. I've, we've got a fun picture of her like like a sh I'm a shepherd and she's my lamb up over my shoulders. And she's drastically bigger than the last time I did that. So it'll look kind of funny. But we will probably recreate that as a birthday post. I the um, But she's so well behaved. So it's very easy to incorporate her into all of those life things. But every once in a while we have to say, hey. It's somebody else's somebody turn. Somebody else's turn. And she had a, gave a little pushback for that. And um, in that specific situation, we didn't give in. She um, she got to wear a bark collar for a little bit, and that was enough to say, "Hey, barking's not okay." It's not going to get you what you want. Yep. So, sleep in the crate for a couple nights, and then you're even more excited and happy to get the bedroom opportunity. Yes. Now, the next thing is is crate size. Um, to be completely honest, dogs enjoy smaller spaces than they do larger spaces. With the caveat saying they need enough space still, but um, I wouldn't expect, you know, don't think that you need to get an extra, extra large crate so the dog has the ability to completely sprawl out and not touch any sides of the crate. Um, but with a 65 pound dog, I would say on average, a large size crate is going to be close, um, close enough to what you need. So good question. 
Really good question. Both of them were really good questions that you snuck in there. I like that. Sneaky. Mike Dyer from Facebook. I just found your page and YouTube yesterday. Awesome. Awesome. I have a four and a half month old GSP who is a family first dog, but we're hoping to turn into a bird dog. Also awesome. I've checked out a few videos and they are great. I'd like to sign up and follow your program on Patreon. Oh, really cool. So for those of you that are watching that don't know what he's talking about, that is patreon.com slash standing stone kennels. Now, so that there is no confusion in this because we do get the question pretty regularly. uh, What is Patreon? What do I get? So on and so forth. And Patreon is a... um, in addition to the free video content. So please understand this. On YouTube, all of our videos, all of our training videos, all of our content is free. You do not need to pay for any of that. And our goal would be to keep it that way forever. We will continue to put out content for free. What Patreon is, in addition to that, is our ability to give you um, our most powerful tool, which is our ability to read dogs and training situations. So you sign up on Patreon, you're following along with the free content, and then you video your training sessions or have someone video them for you, upload them to YouTube, share us the link, and we can actually watch and say, that looks perfect, or you made this small mistake here, and that goes hand in hand with the video. So the only thing that you are getting when you sign up for Patreon is a direct link, basically, to our ability to answer your questions and or watch and review your training sessions. So again, that's patreon.com slash standing stone kennels. And there's different levels of subscription, if you will, from just supporting us and making this great content for you guys. People yeah, if you just like watching the videos, some people say, what can we do? Yeah, because they're like, hey, we know this takes time. We know that the equipment is expensive. Here, we want to help you out because we want you to keep making stuff. Then there's other levels where people just want to ask questions and they'll type up a question kind of like this, except they're guaranteed to get their question answered yep. when they ask it uh, because there's only a limited number that we can get to every week with Yawa, of course. And then there's the level that Ethan was talking about with the video exchange where we're able to watch a training session. And then we even have a top tier that allows you to set up phone consults with us. So you're again then paying for it's a subscription service, but you're paying for our time over the phone one on one if that's what uh, works best for you. So guys, definitely check that out. And if there's a tier that fits your needs, uh, we appreciate you signing up. And I do want to give a quick shout out to Patreon members. They um, all of the money that goes to us via Patreon goes directly back into um, creating this content that everybody gets utilized for free. So the Patreon money um, just bought a new lens for the camera, which that camera, that lens is all of that photography that we put out and all of the pictures um, start to come And to allowing that. us to get some better video coverage of stuff. Like yeah, one of we them. Actually, okay. Go ahead. Oh, he's going to let me tell oh, about it. Go ahead. So Sprig, everybody loves Spriggy, and we just took him back and his homecoming video, we were able to shoot with the new lens that we got. And it was a really awesome video that incorporated both Sprig and him doing some last little training drills with Ethan and his breeder there at Riverstone Kennels, as well as his daddy Brock was able to showcase some of his skills, which was really cool to see. So we got some cool drone footage, which was also something we were able to yeah, get through. The, the drone Patreon we bought. A while ago. Yep. Uh, quite a while ago. But so again, a big thank you. And so that people understand what happens, all of that money we set aside is 100% dedicated to um, creating more content and doing a better job for you guys. So that was a long way to get around to ask, answering Mike's question of, while the videos are very helpful, I'd like to know if there is a recommended order or plan to follow and is it age specific? Thanks. So... Like, you always make me do the links thing so I can throw this one in because I'm... I always forget how to say the links, yep. right? So um, as far as the the plan and the specific thing, we've got two parts to this. One part, I'm going to give you the short answer. Part two, um, Kat's going to give you the, the long answer because this is something as a project that we're really, really excited and excited about and she's heading up right now. So um, first of all, short answer, standingstonekennels.com slash links. Throw it up on the screen. Now, um, if you follow that, it's going to give you, <laughs> um, click the button, it'll say each individual dog series. And that's a playlist. Those 
items are in order. Now, if you watch the order, you will see that we taught different dogs different things in different orders because that was the order they needed to learn them in. Um, with that being said, try and find the dog that best fits your dog's personality and then kind of stick with that. Those are the order and the first time we did those sessions so that you can see live how that worked. And how we had to sometimes live. work through an issue if it arose in yep. the training session. And then the second part uh, is... Is there a recommended cat. plan to follow? Not currently. It's been something that's been requested over and over and over and over and over and over again. Yes. And as you guys know, when you request something, we typically try and get around to doing it, uh, oh. making time for that, whether it's a new video that somebody wants to see, a question that gets asked a lot that we need to answer, or a training plan that everyone wants to follow. So with that... I am in the process of writing basically a eight week old to year old lesson plan. So it's the first year of your dog's life and all of the steps and all of the order that we recommend going in from eight weeks to a year. And that is a huge undertaking. It's taking me a very huge. long time to write. I would say each lesson. It's not just a little bullet point no, step by step. It each is lesson plan, true lesson plans. Each lesson plan. And I think I've got 28 or 30 lesson plans um, to get you through that first year. Each one is taking me approximately three hours to write. So it's going to be a little bit before it's out because I have to find that time to write them. But I think that it's going to be a really awesome tool and people are going to really enjoy it. And that will be available um, eventually when this it's finished to our Patreon members, as well as it will be available to other people on our online store once it's finished. Um, the only cautionary thing that I want to mention with that is people always push for an age to do this at, an age to do this at. Well, if you follow this plan step by step, um, from eight weeks on, that's great. But if you have a four month old dog or, or a six month old dog or, or a year old, year old dog, dog and yep. you're like, well, where do I start? Well, obviously I'm recommending doing this lesson at 16 weeks old. Well, you can still start in the same order and take approximately the same amount of time. And it also depends on how much time you have to invest into your training sessions and your dog. So you just have to follow the order dependent on what age your dog is when you start this program and how long it takes you to get through each step is going to vary that age a little bit. 100%. So those things are coming. Unfortunately, they are not ready today, but we are working on them. And like all we do, we want it to be good. So we're not half-assing yeah, it. I'm not just and, throwing something together and be like, eh, good and enough. Good stuff takes time. So be patient with us and we'll have that out to you as soon as we can. Great. Next question is from Mary Jordan Roy on Facebook. My 12-week GSP is very slow eater. Will eat maybe a half a cup on his 20 minute window. He is walked in the morning and has puppy playtime. I don't want him to be hungry during the day when we go back to work. What can I do to make sure he eats enough to hold him over the course of the day? So your puppy's 12 weeks old and they're getting playtime and walking time and things like that. That's great. I would say your puppy is just a little less food motivated than we'd like to see at 12 weeks. And that maybe is because he's given a free meal that he can pick at for 20 minutes. So we actually teach our dogs to eat. A little bit of tough love is going to go a long way in this specific situation to developing a better all around dog for the future. That's willing to work as well as uh, understands the importance of working. And as well as eats when you need them to eat. So yes. what we say, what we mean by that is. It's an extremely overlooked thing. Yes. And because everyone wants to be their dog's best friend and they just want to love them and cuddle them and coddle them. And that isn't going to be setting them up for success. Just like with our son. I mean, I love him to bits and pieces and he is so sweet most of the time. There are times that he's not though. And if I just try and coddle him and cuddle him through that, I'm just going to create this child that grows up to be an adult that is not a good part of society. So he gets a little tough love. If he's throwing a temper tantrum for no good reason, he's not going to get coddled through that. So um, the same thing can apply to dogs. You sure. have to have a little bit of tough love to make sure that you're developing the dog that you truly want to be a part of your family for the rest of their lives. So, so our recommendation with food would yep. be Making utilize, them work for their meals. Yep. Utilize that meal for a training session. We talk about that all the time, especially at this stage in the game. You'll do as many reps as you can keep their focus for. Now, to begin with, especially if you have a little bit pickier eater, that may be one rep or it may be zero reps even. They go, meh, if I have to work for this, I don't care. Um, so 
what this is where the tough love part comes in. Take a deep breath. Skip that meal. You get if the opportunity to eat. eat. They say, Meh, not interested. Then you hold it for the evening. Now, that meal has disappeared. So the evening, you're only getting that half of a portion again. Of half of a daily Half portion. of a day portion. So if he's excited to work for that, great. Keep on that path. When he loses focus. Take it away. The rest of the meal is gone. And that is going to develop a dog that understands, hey, I need to eat what they provide and I need to stay focused and pay attention when that food is presented in front of me. Because, you know, otherwise I'm going to be hungry during the day and that's going to build drive and desire to work, which is super important for a young hunting dog. Yes. I think Great we, question. Yes. I think we have time for one last very quick question and I mean it. It's very quick. Got it. Michael D. Paulitz from Facebook. I see the orange speckled Rufflin kennels on the Facebook story all the time. And I'm really curious about what size they are, intermediate or large. So the orange ones that you see in our story all the time are the intermediate size. If you see some of the tan ones in the kennel, those are the larges. And then in our, um, our personal dog area in the house, we also have orange speckled ones, but those are larges. So, um, we have a combination of sizes. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, when we move into our new kennel, we're hoping to upgrade all of our kennel sizes to the larges for the most part. I don't think we'll completely get rid of intermediates because there is a place for an intermediate sized crate. Sometimes we'll have smaller dogs, a uh, little English cocker size that the small crates are a better size for them, as well as if we're really struggling to help potty train one of the dogs in the kennel to help continue consistency and help them continue to be clean, a smaller space is actually better for that. So. We won't completely get rid of intermediates because there is, like I said, a place for those as well as when we're raising and developing a puppy of our own, we kind of graduate through different sizes of crates, starting with a small one so that they have only a limited amount of space to curl up, stand up and sit down in. They don't have room to play in one end and pee and poop in the other end. And then once they outgrow that size, we move up to a size and then eventually their last size would be that large. So no, see, that works see, perfect. It was a quick question. It is a quick question. Now the next thing uh, that we really like, and you will see these on, available on our website, are Lucky Kennels. It's by Lucky Duck Decoy Company that created their own um, kennel, and they are one five star crash testing. They're one of two crates, I believe, and you can fact check me on this one. And they're one of two crates available. The other would be Gunner, um, but. The Lucky Kennels are absolutely fantastic. They have one size right now. I know that they're looking to upgrading to another size as well here. he I just talked to um, the owner and he was talking about the potential of that happening soonish, like within the next year. So Now that they just got that crash test yes, and then figured out their new door system that allowed them to get that five-star rating, now they're ready to do more production in different sizes so that they can meet a different demand. Which is awesome. And the big thing that we hear from pushback on that is, wow, they're expensive or something to that effect, uh, probably with a little more gusto. Wow, these are expensive. Um, but the thing about it is, uh, save your pennies, put the things of art. It's a very inexpensive uh, insurance, insurance policy po that's what I was and, just gonna say. And, and protection, you know, for your pets, uh, who's a loved family member. And, and it's a, Really, when you look it's at- It's a lifetime crate. You're going to purchase one. Right. One crate. And you look at the price of that crate compared to the price of most puppies, it's still a very small fraction of the price of that puppy. So exactly. you look at one lifetime investment of a crate to have this one, hopefully lifetime investment of a dog, have a safe place to be when you're traveling um, and to keep them from having- and lifetime, a not only for accident. the dog that you have, but your next dog. I mean, these things are built like tanks. They're going to last forever. Yeah. So, um, but take a look at those as far as a travel crate goes. Um, there are other brands out there that do a good job too, but there are very few that actually pass, you know, crash tests and Scenarios. hard crash tests. I mean, they, they struggled with the first attempt I know, and they made changes to be better and have now passed. So you've got a dog that's going to be safe in the Lucky Kennels. Definitely check those out. Standingstonekennels.com slash store. Perfect. Well, we... Guys, that's the end of part two. Yes, I'm going to cut her off. What he said. Every time. What do you got? 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 What Thank you all for following along and watching this episode of Yawa. We will be back shortly with part three. I'm the guy with the pink gun. And I'm Cat the dog trainer. We'll see you soon. <laughs>